Romans 5, 17, if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? And I read translation. Above the opaque mystery of God's permission of evil shines the light of the gospel. The Son of Righteousness has arisen with healing in its rays. And I see fit as the final stage in our tour to explore the place of possibility in God's response to the intrusion of evil, God's counter move against evil, which we may call salvation. The warrant for this addition to the five other lectures that dealt with evil <laughs> and the category of possibility uh, would be this. The truth about evil is only known through the word of God's response of salvation. Evil, and it is part of its evilness, disguises itself. Evil robs itself in 10,000 deceptions. Evil is the lie and the sway of the liar. So as long as we live under the dominion of sin, it distorts our vision. The light that is within us is darkness, to use Jesus' words in this short parable of Matthew 6, 23. Since we remain human, uh, God's creatures, we do uh, experience the uncanny consciousness that things are not as they ought to be, and we are not as we ought to be. But this is half repressed, deviated, and we don't know evil and our evil in truth. Only through the word received of God's special revelation, which belongs to God's work of salvation, do we know truly what is the singularity and uh, how possibility should be handled in relationship to uh, the, the rising of evil. And this is, I think, what legitimates, I hope you accept it, uh, that this topic, possibility and salvation, uh, be added to what we have seen together uh, to this point. I must clarify, however, one aspect. I am not reversing the order creation for redemption. You know that this was the feat of Karl Barth's Christological concentration. His method compelled him to affirm Jesus Christ as the real first Adam, and Adam, <coughs> Adam the sinner, as secondary after Christ. Barth thus achieved a grandiose symmetry, but uh, in my analysis, at least, that was the temptation. A dialectic structure was erected, which was able, despite Barth's protests, <laughs> to comprehend evil as the polar opposite. No, I maintain that in the biblical vision, evil is an intruder in the first creation of God, that it precedes salvation. Salvation is God's reply and repair of the damages that have been done. It is a repair so radical that it is a new creation with a new Adam to lead a new humanity. Only coadnos, as far as our access to this truth is concerned, uh, the work of salvation comes first in our experience. Uh, the ordo cognoscendi, the order of knowledge, 
is often the reverse of the ordo essendi, the order of being. I'm dealing with the relationship with possibility and salvation in three parts, which follow in a way that will not surprise you. The possibility of salvation decided upon in God's plan, the possibility of salvation provided by the cross, and the possibility of salvation as long as it is called today in the present stage of the history of salvation. With the Apostle Ephesians 1, we should start before the foundation of the world. The story starts there. And then the phrase before the foundation of the world also occurs in 1 Peter 1.20. In other texts, we read from the foundation of the world. But I see no clear difference of meaning between the two. Titus 1.2 has a strange phrase, before primordial times or eternal times, some could also translate. Scripture teaches that those who will be saved have been chosen beforehand, their salvation being bound with the fulfillment of Christ's mission and their own coming to faith. I think this is part of the import uh, of the in Christ specification of election in uh, Ephesians 1. Since I see no hint of the Leibnizian idea uh, of the insertion of such events as a mathematical series in the sequences of possible worlds, I already uh, offered a critique uh, of this idea of Leibniz. I leave this aside at this, at this time. I also uh, re refuse um, the attempt to distinguish between main axes of history, which God would have decided upon, and particular events which he would have left uh, indeterminate. I think this scheme is des desperately anthropomorphic. It imposes upon God our measurements, as if for the Lord God one day was not as long as a thousand years for us. <laughs> this is said also. <laughs> one day is just as one thousand years <laughs> for God, not just the reverse, you see. Uh, our measurements uh, cannot apply. And scripture attests, for instance, in Judah's case, the foreordination of most individual decisions. <coughs> I also will not follow Karl Barth's construal of the duality. It is bound with the methodological concentration I also already mentioned. But you know that in his doctrine of election, elect and reprobate apply both to all men and to Christ, so that it no longer divides among human individuals. Uh, each individual is in Christ, both reprobate and elect, and Christ uh, took upon him the reprobation, and so ultimately election uh, overcomes reprobation. But this does not create two groups, two categories within humankind, according to Barth's construction. I think it cannot be sustained exegetically. Uh, I cannot prove that, but I believe that Barth himself would have granted, uh, at least if cornered, <laughs> that this was not the meaning of the human author of the Apostle Paul as such. But you see, his doctrine of scripture enabled him to uh, see a meaning which the human author would not have had in mind. And I think this was the case for the doctrine of election and the use of the passages in Paul's epistles. Uh, as to the uh, key chapters, Romans 9 to 11, I recommend uh, D David Gibson's bulky and very precise study of this particular point in the, the book, Engaging with Barth. Should we speak of possibility 
in relationship with this uh, election and foreordination, uh, predestination, if, if you like. Uh, as I suggested in, in a previous lecture, uh, God's decree is apart from chains of possibilities. And I would not prefer uh, to, to speak of possibility in this respect. It grants all reality of which we can meaningfully say something, but it is uh, entirely uh, apart. But if we consider God's uh, actually uh, uh, putting to work what he has decided, and in the whole of history, preparation included, then I think we may speak of real possibility with certain occurrence about God's work fulfilling his decree of election in human history. It creates a real possibility of certain occurrence uh, for the elect, those who shall inherit salvation. This would be the way I uh, use the category uh, I tried to elucidate. A word here, I think, should be added on a special doctrine. It is relevant to our reflection because it deals with a specific kind of possibilities. It is an old doctrine which Protestants have either ignored or rejected, but which has been revived recently and has found very able spokesmen among evangelicals. To uh, foremost thinkers, the philosopher Alvin Plantinga uh, and the apologist, but also philosopher and theologian, William Lane Craig. This is the doctrine of middle knowledge. And since it does speak of what the theory considers as possibilities, I think I should say a word about that theory. It derives its, one of its names from the main inventor. It is called Molinism from the name of the Jesuit theologian Luis de Molina in the end part of the 16th century. Actually, he had got the idea from a teacher, Pedro de Sobre Fonseca. And the other name is Scientia Media in Latin or Middle Knowledge. A second theologian whom some celebrated in his day as the new Augustine, Francisco Suarez, another Spaniard, developed a slightly different version. And the Jesuit order made it the spearhead of its theological influence. We may note it's different of motive between Molina and Suarez. Molina's concern was first and foremost to defend free will, undetermined by God. And he wanted to defend it, especially against Protestants. They are the great, great opponents. Suarez, assuming such free will, wished to protect the truth of God's sovereign election. That would be the difference in motives between the two men. Middle knowledge, middle of what? The thesis is this. God possesses three and not two knowledges. He possesses the knowledge of all possibilities, all things non-contradictory, before any exercise of his will. I'm reluctant to adopt this scheme. I said before why in the previous lecture, but this was traditional, and this was admitted. There is this necessary knowledge of God of all things not, not contradictory. Then God possesses the free knowledge of the things that shall come to pass. Why? Because he had decided them. It is free because it is based on the decree that God freely decided. And the doctrine claims, in between, middle, he possesses the knowledge of what would happen, what humans would decide in a given set of circumstances. In a situation fully defined and described, God knows how moral agents endowed with free will would respond. He knows that Peter, in his undetermined free will, 
We respond yes in this situation, and Adolf will, will answer no. And so God, in order to carry out his decree of election, brings about the adequate sets of circumstances. The elect come to faith without his interfering with free will. See? That was what uh, Molina uh, sought, having election without any interference of God with free will. God indirectly uh, uh, obtains what he wants through providing the set of circumstances. God's sovereign choice operates, and free will suffers no manipulation from God. This is the satisfaction of Molina and Suarez also. Molina defended his views in such ponderous volumes, in, and in Latin, of course, that even the Cardinal, Cardinal Bellarmine complained. <laughs> <laughs> I think the complexity and sheer mass tends to stifle the sense of right and wrong. <laughs> and I suggest that it often happens in the microcosm of specialized intellectuals. You see. Uh, the complexity of argument, the, the number of references, uh, they uh, require all the energy of the reader uh, that he may get through. And so he has no longer any energy uh, left to really to, to evaluate the thesis uh, that is there. And, and, and there may be an enormous objection, and it's too big uh, to, to be seen. Uh, and this is very often why things very, very odd have been accepted for a generation. And then the, the next generation says, how could they accept that? <laughs> and I think this happened with Molina. He wishes to safeguard the indeterminacy of free will. But he bases his whole thing on a certain correlation between a set of circumstances and the decision humans, moral agents, will make. And this is a bond that cannot be broken. Uh, it is absolutely certain uh, in, in, in his system. But does it not make determinate the decision? Because this, this is known before the foundation of the world. <laughs> if Peter, in this set of circumstances, uh, will say yes, and this is absolutely certain, is this not determinate? What is left of the free will they want to, to preserve? You see? If God this does not determine it, then who, what, determines it? So I think this is an enormous objection that they have not been able to solve. In painting, I think English, according to my dictionary, uses a French phrase, uh, trompe l'oeil. Trompe l'oeil. It means that the eye is deceived. The eye, oeil, is deceived, trompe, trompe l'oeil, by the clever touch of the artist. I suggest that Molinism is a kind of theological trompe l'oeil. Having dealt with this first uh, relationship of possibility, mainly negatively, I, I acknowledge, then I come to uh, my second part, the possibility of salvation provided by the cross. We have all heard it, probably we have all said it, Christ's death on the cross made salvation possible. Common evangelical parlance considering the centrality of the cross in the gospel message, for the preaching of the cross is the power of God unto salvation, sees no problem in translating on the basis of Christ's death for sins. If you believe on him, you shall be saved by the proposition Christ secure the possibility of salvation. And statements along that line 
could be found in many, many theological writings. I was somewhat surprised to find so few instances of the same in the New Testament itself. The nearest form of expression, which I found, would be Hebrews 7.25, through his self-sacrifice, our royal high priest is able, do not die, to save with maximum effect, completely and totally. This is the statement. So you may say there you have the idea of possibility. Uh, he can. Maybe we could quote Acts 4.12, though the verb is that of necessity. There is no other name in which we must be saved. Maybe this much suggests some uncertainty and therefore possibility. I see only one other use of dunamai referring to Christ's death. And it is quite different. In Hebrews 5.7, Jesus prayed to God who could save him from death. And he was answered because of his godly fear, the text says. Also in the mockery of Matthew 27, when Christ was crucified, he cannot save himself. These are the instances of which I found the, the verb of possibility is used in relationship with Christ's death. The verb dunamai, uh, otherwise, is found a few times when the subjective conditions of salvation are in view, but especially in negative propositions. After Jesus' slogan on the difficulty for the rich, with the simile of the camel going through the needle's eye, the disciples, more intelligently than usual, <laughs> exclaim, who can be saved? And Jesus answers, as we saw already, it is impossible for man, but to God, everything possible. In Acts 15.1, the Judaizing party stipulates that without circumcision, one cannot be saved. James 2.14 asks the rhetorical question about the faith deprived of works. Can this faith save? And in 4.12, he warns about God. And final judgment, God is the one able, dynaminos, to save and not to send into perdition. But you see, this is not directly what we, I was looking for, uh, statements about the cross making salvation possible. Uh, the multiple language we find rather follows the pattern of Hebrews 5 9. Christ has become the author of eternal salvation. God saved us, not he made our salvation possible. <laughs> this is worth noticing and meditating, I think. Yes, I would not draw the conclusion that the language of possibility should be totally ruled out, out of court. I think the legitimacy of it is maintained, can be buttressed by the conditionality, frequently conjoined, believe in him and you shall be saved. The salvation of the elect has not yet become actual in their lives at the stage of the cross. So I think we may, on this basis, use the language of uh, possibility. A fair summary of biblical evidence enables us to say the atonic sacrifice was offered, but those who have been elected according to the foreknowledge of God, must also receive the sprinkling of Christ's blood. First Peter 1, the verses. Or the ransom price has been paid. Men were imprisoned by the law. Uh, the expression of God's justice required it. And the ransom, the payment of their debt, so that the charge of the legal indebtedness be canceled, Colossians 2.14, uh, happened at the cross. But before faith, the prisoners have not yet enjoyed the benefit of their release. Substitute punishment was inflicted on the righteous one, but the acquittal verdict has not yet been pronounced, for justification is by faith. This distinction 
enables us to speak of possibility. I know that some worthies of the past, and among them the great Abraham Kuyper, have defended a lot of you on the last point I mentioned uh, on punishment and justification. He spoke of an eternal justification of the elect. Berkauer's comment, Berkauer was the professor of systematic theology in the Free Faculty, founded by Kuyper in, uh, in Amsterdam, Free Faculty of Theology, Bacauer's comment is severe indeed, but I think not undeserved. I quote, this conception of eternal justification reveals how a speculative logic can invade a scriptural proclamation of salvation and torture it beyond recognition. <laughs> James Packer tells of Baxter's refutation of the thesis that had already been uh, suggested in his time, uh, Baxter developed his critique, quote, not only because he could make exegetical and philosophical mincemeat of it, as he could and did, <laughs> but because of its practical implications if pressed to its logical conclusions. He uh, says or sees that, that the advocate did not press it to the logical conclusions. Karl Barth, again, concentration, has produced a more radical and monumental version with the world already justified and sanctified in the only real event, the Christic event. And Barth can boldly label epiphenomenon all that comes after the representatio and oblatio of the sun, the offering of the sun, in the moment of all moments. He uses that word epiphenomenon, which is quite striking, in, uh, uh, in the English translation, Church Dogmatics, for 1 page 315, if you doubt me. <laughs> for Bart, faith only makes us realize that it is so, that it is the ground on which we stand, the air that we all breathe. I have explained elsewhere why I cannot follow Bart. So I would suggest that the proper uh, proposition is that Christ's work on the cross created the real possibility of salvation for future believers, and for future believers, a real possibility of certain occurrence. Among evangelicals, this last clause will not be received by all, uh, at least not in the same sense. And uh, I think I should uh, also say a few words on this. Minds separate on the relationship between Christ's actual word, work in his first coming, and centrally in the hour for which he came into the world, the hour of the cross, and the reality of salvation in the lives of individuals. What's the relationship? You have two positions, roughly at least. The two positions are known as, known as definite atonement, less happily by some limited atonement. It was expressed by the canons of Dort in the 17th century. And hypothetical universalism, or amiraldism, from the name of the reformed theologian of the Saumur Academy uh, who defended it, uh, Moïse Amiro. There was also a slightly different form in, in England, but amiraldism is a common uh, name for the theory, hypothetical universalism. It is universalist in the sense that the cross is considered to have an equal uh, reference to all all individuals, or all in the more statistical sense. Uh, but it is hypothetical. Uh, it would be universal in effect if all had faith. But this is a hypothesis that will not be uh, real, uh, not correspond to reality. So it is not universalism in the end. It is hypothetical universalism. 
for hypothetical universalism, or is Amiro, the cross was intended to provide equally for all human individuals uh, as a basis for the gospel uni universal offer, a real possibility of salvation, real possibility. Hmm. But such a possibility as not entailing certainty. Uh, salvation requires to become actual that uh, another condition be met, faith. And this is to be considered separately. This is the scheme for hypothetical universalism. For definite atonement, on the contrary, the cross provided, indeed, a sufficient basis for universal offer, but it was intended first and foremost in order to entail the certainty of salvation for future believers and for most defenders, the elect. Final unbelievers, impenitent to the end, are not intended as beneficiaries of Christ's substitution. And for them, there is no real possibility. Whereas for the elect, there is real possibility with uh, certainty of occurrence. I cannot enter the debate. Uh, definite atonement hypothetical universalism. And again, I recommend a book, a symposium that was published quite recently. From heaven, he came and sought her, Christ the church. But I just offer three comments on points that I think suffer from obfuscation in uh, many people's mind. Three, three points. Uh, first, strict logic does not bind definite atonement to Calvinism and hypothetical universalism to uh, Arminianism on election. Uh, though, in fact, there is a, a connection. Uh, most people who adhere to uh, this position uh, follow that connection. But it is not strictly logical. You may be a Miraldian and a Calvinist. Actually, Moïse Amiro was. Uh, on election and predestination. You may be Armenian and hold to definite atonement. The elect in the Armenian scheme are elect on the basis of the for knowledge of their faith, considered to be undetermined by God. But this is already sure before the foundation of the world. And it is entirely possible to uh, conceive of an atonement uh, for just these uh, elect future believers. Second remark, the clash is not that of dogmatics, which would be on the side of Calvinists, and exegesis, with, which would be on the side of hypothetical universalism. Some independent scholars have concluded that the exegesis of the oral, overall biblical evidence uh, is on the side of uh, the uh, definite atonement advocates. And uh, we may note that among uh, hypothetical universalists, you had dogmaticians. Moïse Amiro was one. Again, he was not the first, first a biblical scholar, but a systematic theologian. So again, it would be an artificial dichotomy uh, to uh, confuse uh, the difference of, of opinion on this issue. and. Uh, the predominance of one of the disciplines, dogmatics or exegesis. Third remark, in the footsteps of Abraham Kuyper, I stress to find not strictly a third way, but still another presentation I did in the book I mentioned. I stress the organic solidarity of humankind under the covenant head. Christ, as the new Adam, takes on the responsibility of humankind as an organic whole, of anthropos. And he redeems it as an organic whole. So that individuals that are not saved are to be considered as cut off branches, cut off parts that do not follow uh, the organic whole of humanity which Christ 
takes upon himself in the transition from the old creation to the new creation. I think this is a perspective that has not been uh, widespread and is not known by many, and it is useful to mention it. Third section, the possibility of salvation as long as is it, it is called today in the present economy. The possibility of salvation, of being saved, may be analyzed, I think, in a threefold manner. In themselves, under the bondage of sin, in the concrete management of their lives, human individuals have no concrete possibility of reaching out to salvation in themselves. Those who are in the flesh are unable to please God. The apostle says, Romans 8, 8, the man without the spirit, the psychikos, uh, he is ruled by his own psyche, his own soul, uh, cannot know and receive the things of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 14. And Jesus himself, what is flesh, is unable to see the kingdom of God. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is flesh is unable. So in that first sense, concrete ability, uh, then we must say there is no possibility, according to those passages. Second, however, if we consider separately, separately, the persistent possessions of human nature in human individuals, in sinners, they still have the faculties of intelligence and will. And they could believe, as far as these faculties are concerned, if they so will. The hindrance does not come from outside, does not come from coercion. Even Satan's influence is not enough to prevent them. The hindrance consists of their own willing. And this is why they remain responsible and blameworthy, liable to condemnation. This possibility, which is linked to the makeup of humanity, of human nature, creates a possibility. We could say it is a real possibility at the level of metaphysical analysis. If we consider uh, those uh, persons, also all sinners, the paradox is that it is a real possibility of, non of certain non-occurrence. If we still consider them by themselves, they are unable by their own choice, but it, it is so. But at the same time, we may mention a real possibility of, we may, see, we may say, a metaphysical character. And third, when God intervenes, and when he gives repentance and faith, then the possibility becomes a possibility of certain occurrence. You see the nuances with the categories we have tried to define. Here another old issue raises its head. Is it possible for truly recreated persons, members of Christ's body, born again, as we say, to sin? And especially, so to sin that, like Adam in Eden, they are severed from the fellowship of God. Is there a possibility for them to be unsaved? As sometimes the word is used. This is an old debate, but I hope my remarks will be of some help to you, at least of some interest to you. Uh, first, as to the general possibility of committing sin, 1 John 3, 9 and 5, 18 seem to rule it out. He who is born of God cannot sin. <laughs> but as is well known, other verses in Scripture and in 1 John itself, in the epistle, prove that it cannot be the meaning. Various ways of reconciling apparently divergent passages have been offered. 
You may especially read John Stott in his short commentary on, on, on this. So uh, I think there is no need for us at this time to canvas them. <laughs> you may find them in books. Uh, it seems to me that uh, we, we can say it is a real possibility for uh, re regenerate uh, believers to sin. Sinless perfection shall not be attained in this life. And at the same time, it is so monstrously, mon monstrously contradictory of the privileges of sonship, of the indwelling by the Holy Spirit. Though it is linked to the vestiges of the old person in us and with our present in the world that lies in the evil one, but it is so contradictory of the grace we have received that I consider that the permission by God that it happens is part of the opaque mystery. I cannot explain it again. It is uh, hurtful that we should uh, recognize it. But now as to the possibility that uh, someone be unsaved as the phrase goes, that means that someone risen with Christ should die again. Someone recreated should be decreated. That eternal life received proved short-lived. I will not rehearse the arguments. Uh, this is an, an old debate, but again, I offer three remarks. First, again, about strict logic, but this time it is uh, even more of, of a historical fact. Historically, opposition of this issue does not coincide with that of strong predestinarianism and Arminianism. Actually, St. Augustine and Luther, who were strong predestinarians, and sometimes in hyperbolic terms that would hesitate to uh, make my own professed that some truly regenerate person could lose their salvation. Simply, they said that they were not among the elect. They considered the possibility that some non-elect be regenerate for a time. This is at least a logical possibility. <laughs> and they chose that. Conversely, they have been Arminians who have thought that free will, once rooted and established in grace, is strong enough never again to choose the folly of unbelief. So you see, you don't have a coincidence between the two uh, contrasting pairs of views. Second of my remark, in the key passage, Hebrews 6, you know, all of you, that this passage, of course, is a, a knot of disputations. I mentioned that impossible, a dunaton, it is impossible for them to be renewed again. In verse 4, could be interpreted in context in this way. It is impossible for the writer, through his arguments, to renew them. This would agree with the immediate context. I'm not going, going back to the elements of the faith, not laying down again the foundations. Because it is impossible <laughs> to renew uh, those uh, who are in, uh, in view. So this impossible might be interpreted uh, of the possibilities uh, uh, the writer sees in, in his use uh, of doctrinal uh, elements and, and arguments. And this is, I think, an interesting and little known uh, possibility of interpretation in this passage. Third remark, practically all difficult passages, at least difficult passages for communists, <laughs> uh, deal with the case of apostates, persons who have professed the faith, have been, the mem have been members of churches, and now are denying the master who, according to the confession they had uttered, had bought them. 
This is a special case. It's not just said in, in a general fashion of all non-believers. First John 2.19 intimates that they were not truly of us, of us Christian, regenerate Christians. And John says if they had, they would have remained with us. Jesus, in his parable of the sower, warns about superficial, temporary faith. Mark 4.17, explaining the seed fallen on rocky ground. This temporary faith, according to Jesus' teaching in this chapter, at first looks like authentic faith. It may even grow faster. It may have a, a better appearance, a true faith. And yet, it is not true faith. I think we seldom hear the echo of this admonition in our churches. If we look abstractly at ourselves, I think we may admit that the real possibility of our falling away is there. We are so weak. And were it not for God's grace, what would happen to us? But if we see the whole picture with the Lord's hand holding his sheep so that no one shall snatch them, I think we may say that it makes the actualization of this possibility of falling impossible. What about then the restoration in this time of our pilgrimage on earth of the original posse non peccari, the possibility of not sinning? I criticize the injunction by Augustine of the possibility of sinning in Eden, but the possibility of not sinning was valid indeed. Uh, it may be symbolized, I think, in the story by the continual enjoyment of the tree of life. If sin is no longer to reign in our mortal bodies, Romans 6, I think we cannot avoid the thought, and should not avoid, the thought of a restoration of this possibility not to sin. A real possibility uh, not in isolation, but as we are faithfully held and born by the Good Shepherd's hand. So this is a real possibility now. We have to rule out, as we already saw, perfectionism. No total sinlessness in this life. Remnants of our old self prevent by God's opaque permission that we should not love God at every moment with all our heart and strength. Uh, and so we break the first commandment. Uh, this is why we can only stand before God with the alien righteousness, the gratuitous gift of righteousness of God uh, clothing us in God's presence. Even our best work cannot uh, give us a title to this uh, freedom to go to the throne of grace and be received by God, our Heavenly Father. But there are works, however. There are works whose root now is sane because of the Holy Spirit given us. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. There are works that are the fruit of grateful love and a sincere desire, desire that God be glorified. These words are not perfect. They need that Christ's perfection covers all the defects that remain, but still in Christ they are acceptable. Their rootage also entails a new dominant style, walking in the spirit as God himself is in the light, walking in his light. I think we may observe a symmetry with the good words uh, of the hidden, of the non-regenerate. These good words have 
sometimes a, a magnificent external beauty, but the root of God's love is still lacking. Our works may be not so beautiful to look upon from the outside, uh, not so uh, uh, magnificent. But the new root implanted by grace uh, within us makes it possible for these good works to be acknowledged as such, received as such. And this corresponds to real possibility. In other words, sanctification is not an empty term nor a stop-start process. The Bible tells the truth of the title, the pilgrim's progress. <laughs> so you see another category of uh, real possibility. And beyond. It is my conclusion, but it is the fourth part, if you will, at the same time after the three other parts. What should we say about the final stage or state? There was a question in the previous period about this. Augustine's formula will apply. Non posse peccari. Impossibility for us of sinning. Sin shall be no more. I think this is the message of Revelation 21 and 22. God's victory will be total. Uh, and the prayer or lament will have received its answer, how long, O oh Lord? Not any longer then, <laughs> in the presence of our Lord. Never more uh, any sin, never more any condemnation, <clears throat> ne never more any curse. Uh, this is clearly uh, the message that we are told. The alien intruder will have no place left whatsoever. Then the question may be raised, the question that was raised. Why is all real possibility of a new fall excluded? Because I would so argue. In the case of the redeemed in the final state, it's not only that they cannot any more sin, but that they cannot uh, fall. Uh, enter into a, a, a new situation uh, as that of Genesis 3. I suggest the following answer. It's because the new Adam, the head of humankind, <coughs> recreated is God himself, God the Son. This is the difference, the, the infinite difference between the new creation and the first creation. God the Son is the new Adam. The new Adam is God the Son. With the two nations distinct, but one in him, and he is our head. God binds us to himself in Christ in so tight a fashion that no tighter fashion could be conceived. There cannot be any uh, bonding of creature and God himself tighter than that one. Thought that there could be a more intimate union implies simply the uh, dissolution, dissolving of creature in, into God and not salvation if it is dissolved. This is union, perfect union with distinction remaining. It is the, uh, the maximum possible union of God, and I think this, because we will be members of the body of, of, of God the Son, incarnate, <laughs> uh, rules out that we may fall by the wayside, that we may again yield to folly. No, no. This is excluded because uh, our head is God the Son himself. Uh, we cannot slip away from his loving embrace. Even on the other side, the side of the second death, I believe that sin shall be no more. I think that brought back to God's holy order by punishment, 
the reprobates in their final state shall not sin anymore. That God's victory will be total. Augustine said, the elect shall have no longer any desire, the reprobate any ability to sin. This is found in the in Kiridion uh, 29. I know that not all uh, my dear friends, <laughs> professors of theology, evangelical, uh, uh, agree with this, with this thesis I have defended uh, elsewhere. So I, and also it is my time, <laughs> I will not develop the point uh, now on this. I will not say any more on this. But I am sure that we must all agree that God's victory over evil shall be total and definitive. In the words, the mystic, the medieval mystic Julian of Norwich received in her private revelations from Christ, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. These words resonate in my heart. But it is equivalent to the most briefer expression that we find in, in Scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, and God will be all in all. In all of us. God all. This is the perspective. Uh, this is God's answer to the question, the anguish question about evil. And if we cannot answer uh, the whence and why, we have this certainty, this sure hope, God shall be all in all. Amen. Thank you.